So why 3D printing? I think it's a rhetorical question. 3D printing has been in existence for about 30 years. Uh, it's been utilized in medical industry for m since early 2000. That being said, the use of 3D printing in medicine has rapidly evolved over the past five, few years, maybe three to four years. If you look across all the major centers in the United States or North America, everyone is actually using 3D printing. And 3D printing is changing lives for patients in ways and places we had never imagined a few years ago. So the actual question should not be why 3D printing? The question should be are we already late to jump on this bandwagon? And I think we are already late to jump on this bandwagon. Let's look at the <clears throat> financial aspect of 3D printing. So 3D printing, this is not medical 3D printing, this is 3D printing as a whole. It's about was a $700 million industry in 2011, and it's supposed to be about $10 billion industry in 2019. So there's immense financial potential to this industry. So how do you define 3D printing? Actually, the definition is very, very easy. 3D printing is basically a technique that creates complex yet unique structures layer by layer. That's it. That's the definition. So if you look at this image, you can see, depending on the resolution of the printer, you can see multiple layers over the project. So anything where you build a structure layer by layer is 3D printing. Now, it is also known as rapid prototyping or additive manufacturing. Now, it's called additive manufacturing because to distinguish it, distinguish it from conventional manufacturing. Because in conventional manufacturing, you have an object, whether it's a metal, a rock, or a wood piece. You drill it, you cut it, you shovel it to get to the final product. As opposed to conventional manufacturing, in 3D printing, basically, you add layers by layers. So instead of conventional manufacturing, you're adding stuff. And that's why the term called additive manufacturing. It's also called as rapid prototyping because, the, because of the ease and the rapidity with which we can print objects or models based on 3D printing. So let's look at a workflow of a medical 3D printing. So it all starts, especially for medical 3D printing, it all starts with high resolution images, which in our case are DICOM files. So once we have good quality DICOM files, they undergo a couple of processes, which are segmentation processes. So what the first thing we do is we segment the anatomy which needs to be printed. Once the anatomy that needs to be printed is segmented out using segmentation softwares, that segmented anatomy undergoes another process which is smoothening, you know, finishing, and polishing, and fitting the, fitting the object to create something called as an STL file. Now this is the file, that's the language which every 3D printer understands, it's called a stereolithography file or STL file. Once we have the STL file in the hand, any 3D printer that is available in the market can print that, print that object. So this is a basic workflow. Starts with imaging, segmentation of the anatomy, smoothening, wrapping, converting to an STL file, and then the STL file can then be printed. So that's the basic workflow of any 3D medical 3D printing process. Now, there are multiple segmentation softwares that are available in the market, and as you can see on this slide, most of them are free of cost. Now, most of them have both automated and manual segmentation algorithms. Now, the choice of a segmentation software or a choice of a segmentation algorithm totally depends on the kind of job or the type of industry you're working on. So if, you, if you're doing aviation industry, if you're in medical industry, you will use different segmentation software, you will use dif different segmentation algorithms. Now, when it comes to printer technology, there are multiple things that goes into consideration before you choose a printer. Obviously, you want to look at the cost of the printer, which is the biggest deciding factor. You have to look at the footprint of the printer, how big the printer is, how big the build volume is, how big the uh, object it can print, uh, then how many materials it can print, whether it can print in multiple materials, whether it can print multiple colors. Then there are so many things that goes in deciding the material itself. Is the material cheap? Is the material available? Is the material autoclavable? Is the material moisture resistant? Is the material um, drillable? Is the material we can sew on the material? Is the material biocompatible? And so on and so forth. So basically what I want to say is that one size does not fit all. Just like segmentation algorithm, every, every 3D printing lab, if you, live, if you look across the country, needs at least two or three different types of 3D printers to suffice for the needs. 
Now, there are about nine different printer technologies and six different types of print printers which are available in the market right now. And this number right now is rapidly evolving and growing as we talk. But that being said, there are three most commonly used printer technologies in medical 3D printing. So let's look at those technologies. The number one and the most commonly used is called the FDM technology. It's also called as the Fuse Deposition Modeling. Now this is very similar to our inkjet printer. Now you have a nozzle, as you see on this image, you have a nozzle. Instead of beads of ink, a heated plastic comes out from this nozzle, which is preheated to a temperature. So these are thermoplastic, which are, which are just led on this build platform layer by layer to build the 3D object. So this is the most commonly used technology called as fused deposition um, um, modeling. And these are the most common 3D printers that are available in the market, and they are as cheap as a few hundred dollars to thousands of dollars. You can get an FDM printer for $600 for your home. Uh, the material that is most commonly used for FDM printers is called PLA and ABS. The one we use here at Vanderbilt is called PLA, also known as polyacetic acid. It comes in a one kilogram spool, and the price can range from about $17 for a kilogram to about $100, depending on if the material is flexible, what color you want, you know, if you want more tensile strength, and so on and so forth. The second technology that is used for medical 3D printing is called SLA technology, also known as stereolithography technology. Now in this, as opposed to heated thermoplastic, you have a liquid resin bath. And a laser beam shines on the liquid resin bath, and wherever it shines, it solidifies that liquid and creates, again, object layer by layer by a technique called as photopolymerization. So this one uses plastic, this one uses a liquid resin, and the, the compound for this liquid resin is, called, is, is a methyl acrylate. Now the third most common technology that is used is called as selective laser centering. Now in this case, instead of having a liquid or a plastic, there's a big box that consists of powdered material. And uh, in th this also uses laser beams. So the laser beam creates the object or pre-creates the object and shines into this bucket that contains powdered material and fuses the powdered material together to create the object. Now this technology is superior to these two because when you take out the object, you just have the object. You don't have any support materials. There is very less cleaning required. The product is almost ready. As opposed to FDM and SLA, there's a lot of support material. There's a lot of post-processing, a lot of cleaning that goes into the SLA and FDM technology. Now let's talk about medical applications of 3D printing. I like to divide the medical application of 3D printing into four categories. Number one, teaching and training, you know, for medical students, for residents, fellows, faculty alike. Number two is individualized patient care. Number three is bioprinting, which includes tissue and organ fabrication. Number four is pharmaceutical research. So what, what do I mean by individualized patient care? Now, this is, this is the best example of personalized medicine because you can do everything for one single patient based on 3D printing. You can print a model to give it to the patient to make them understand what's going on, what's, what's going wrong with them. And it's been so useful in children's hospital because we have started giving 3D models to parents to make them better understand what's going on. They have no clue what's going on, why they need a tracheostomy, why they need ex extensive surgery. So we give them the model, we explain them, this is what's wrong with your son or your daughter, this is what we're gonna do. It, it goes a long, long way. It makes them understand better, there's more empathy there. Secondly, it can enhance diagnostic quality. Now we all have conventional imaging, we have CT scans, we have MRI, but there are occasions where we need to better understand what's going on. So having a model in your hand gives you a total different dimension as, as a physician, as a radiologist. The bulk of 3D printing right now is happening for pre-surgical planning and navigation. Basically what you can do is you can simulate multiple steps in a complex procedure. And that's where most of the th medical 3D printing is being utilized. And that's, that's very important because if you look at medical, medicine is the only high stake industry that does not practice before game time. You look at aviation, they have aviation simulators. You look at sports, they practice for months and months before the game they go for the game time. Medicine is the only one that does not have, they have simulators, but they are very, very costly, they're not available. So 3D printing is actually one of the best ways to practice medicine before you actually practice on the patients. 
Radiotherapy planning, there's a lot going on in radiotherapy planning and 3D printing. Last but not the least, 3D printing is very useful when it comes to customization. You know, producing a part, a prosthesis, an implant. Because I work at Children's Hospital, this is especially important for kids. You know, child, a child can grow like weed, with no offense to a child or a weed. What that means is that if a child has a part or a prosthesis or an implant, he, will, he or she will outgrow it pretty quickly. So 3D printing is a very, very effective, very cheap method to keep up with the pace of the child. So let's look at the 3D printing program we have here at Vanderbilt. As of now, anybody can request a 3D print. I will show you in the subsequent slide how to request a 3D print if you want one. All these requests come to us through the radiology department and they undergo something called a pre-design pre approval process. We receive the request, we look at it, we make sure the imaging is right, we'll make a phone call or we'll email you, we'll make sure what do you need is, what part, are you, what part do you need segmented, what's the purpose of the model, are you doing it for surgical planning, is it for patient education, is it for resident education, is it for surgical navigation and so on and so forth. Uh, what do you want, do you want flexible material, do you want tough material, do you want a cheap material, so all this goes on and once we are satisfied we send the, the data to our 3D printing lab, which is located on the first floor radiology department in Children's Hospital, leading the final product. Now, right now, we request you guys to walk over to us to get the print because that gives us verbal feedback right away because we can talk to you guys and say, hey, is this what you were looking for? Do you like this print? Uh, are you satisfied? Can we do something else? Eventually, what we will do is we'll give you the prints, we'll deliver you the prints, and send you an, uh, um, an email saying, please fill the survey. And we all know how good we are filling surveys. We never get surveys, it's only 20% of people. So we definitely request you, if you have a print, please walk over to us. We'll hand you over the print and we can have one-to-one -one discussion. So this is how you can request a, a 3D print. There's an Epic tab, you just click on this Epic tab, uh, which brings down this menu, which there's a, there's a radiology tab underneath the Epic tab. If you click on the radiology tab, there's a 3D print request form. And once you click this, and this is the window you will see. This is all you need to fill. It's a very short form. Basically, what we need is <clears throat> name of the patient, the date the study was done, what's the indication of the study, and how can we contact your email address. That's it. That's all we need. So once, and we definitely need this because this is how we keep you know, our books, our records, and you know, a statistical analysis, and that's easy. And, and if you... There's another link if you don't want to go through Epic, and this is the link. If you click, uh, click on this link, again, I'm happy to email this link that opens up the same form directly. <clears throat> now, as I said, after a good quality imaging, the second most crucial step in 3D printing is segmentation software. Now, if one is producing a model for surgical planning, we need to have good, high-quality medical segmentation software. Now, this is <clears throat> especially important in challenging cases. If you have a challenging, complex anatomical case which needs very good segmentation, you need to have a software which can segment challenging anatomy with ease. So this is the software we have. This is called Mimics Innovation Suite. It's made by a company called Materialize, based out of Michigan. It has multiple other functionalities, as you can see. Uh, we don't own right now all the functionalities, but we are in the process of acquiring all these, the entire suite. Um, this doesn't come cheap. The annual license is about 25000 per year, so it's a pretty expensive software. And the reason we have this software is because if you are producing a 3D model to plan a surgery or for any medical decision making, it's best practice to have a software which is medically cleared. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the only software right now which is medically cleared. So this is 510K cleared, FDA cleared for medical purposes. And that's the main reason. Now there are other benefits for this program, which is very user friendly, it's pretty fast. Now if you go online, as I showed you in the slide earlier, there are multiple, there are about 50 softwares which are free. But if you want to segment yourself and download a free software, you have to go through multiple other softwares. So eventually this is this does everything for you. So that's one reason we have it. The other good thing I like about this software is that 
it creates this PDF file. It, looks, it just looks like a three-dimensional CT, but this is the STL file. So before we print the file, we can send you this PDF. And this can be opened on any computer, smartphone, as long as you have a PDF reader. We can send you this file, and we can say, hey, look at this. This is what we are about to print. Are you happy? Do you want us to do something else? So this is very handy. We, we, print, we email everyone this PDF before we print the actual model. So let's look at our capabilities. Right now, we currently operate three different 3D printers with the ability to print something from the width of a human hair to the entire spine or the entire limb. Uh, this is our first printer, which is called a RAISE 3D ND2. As you can see, this is a very large build volume printer. The reason we have this printer is because we can print the entire spine or the entire extremity in one go. It's also, the resolution is pretty, gr is pretty good. It's about 10 micron layers resolution. And the other advantage of this printer is that we have, this is a dual printer, dual extruder printer. So what it means that we can print a model in two different colors or two different materials. So that's the big advantage of this printer. The second printer, the, by the way, this is an FDM printer. If you remember, this is, that's where the, the um, bead of the plastic is coming in. So this is an FDM printer that uses plastic or PLA. The second printer we have is the SLA printer, and this is the liquid resin bath. And this is the laser beam is shining from the underneath, and it solidifies. This is a very, very high resolution printer. The only disadvantage of this printer is the build volume is pretty low. And this printer has material which is bio has multiple materials which are biocompatible. So we, use this, we are using this extensively for our craniofacial and for our dental work. We are doing all our dental work on this printer. They have dental materials, they have biocompatible bio -compatible materials. Again, very high resolution. The only problem with this printer is small build volume. The third printer we have is called the Maker Gear M2, which is also an FDM printer. And this is the spool I was talking about. This is the PLA plastic, which is wrapped around the spool. Plastic comes in, and it's heated by this nozzle and deposited on this build plate. This is our everyday printer. It's very fast, very reliable, very hi highly accurate. Again, small build volume, but this is what we use for our day-to-day -day printing if you want to print something cheap. Last but not the least, we have something called as an optical scanner. It's a very high resolution scanner. It consists of a projector and a camera. So this projector shines light on the subject. The light is reflected and captured by the camera. And then, so anything, any object, if you have an instrument you want to 3D print, you, have, you want to print a camera, you want to print anything, we can just scan this, convert this to an STL file, and print it. Well, if you, I don't know how many of you are active in social media. If you go on social media platforms, if you go on internet, uh, believe me, I'm not, I'm not um, overemphasize. I need to overemphasize this because if you go on social media, if you go on 3D platforms or websites which are not, you know, very scientific, it may sound like that you can take any imaging and create high quality models. That's not true. In fact, I would argue that most of the imaging we routinely obtain for, for patients is not good for 3D printing. And that's the whole idea. So basically what I, want to, what I want to say is that if you give me garbage in terms of imaging, garbage in, garbage out. So again, high quality imaging, it all starts with high quality, the right type of imaging to get the right type of model. And let's see, let, I'll show you some examples what I mean by that. So right now, what can we use for 3D printing? We you can use any cross-sectional data or any 3D data. If you have a CT scan, it can be 3D printed. If you have an MRI, which is cross-sectional, it can be 3D printed. If you have 3D ultrasound, 3D echo, 3D biplane angio, everything can be used. But if you look in reality, 70% of our models are based on CT. And why is that? And I'll show you why. So let's look at this example. So this is our segment. This is how a segmentation panel looks like uh, from the Mimics Innovation Suite. It's very, very similar for other segmentation softwares. You load the image, and it, you can only load one plane, by the way. You cannot, as of now, right now, we are limited. We cannot load a CT and MRI together, but this is going to change eventually. There are segmentation softwares that are coming very, you can fuse two, two data, and that's going to be very helpful. So you can load one axial image, and it automatically reconstructs into two orthogonal planes. Now here's the problem. So this was an MRI sent to, be, sent to me by my orthopedic colleagues for a fracture for, to print a, a bone fracture. Now, the way segmentation works, it works on a thresholding, thresholding basis. What it means is that 
we try to do automated segmentation as much as possible. It picks up areas which are of different density. For example, on CT scan, the bones, the bones are very dense. So it'll pick up all the bones and subtract all the soft tissue. But with MR, we have a big problem. The problem is the density of the bone is very similar to the density of the subcutaneous tissues in the fat. So there's a, it's a very time intensive process to segment MR because most of the automated methods don't work because of this density issue. The other problem with this case is if the, the slice thickness. Now, MRI is usually obtained at 3 millimeter or 5 millimeter slice thickness. Those are very thick. So when you, when you load this axial data, look at the, the, I don't know how well it is projecting with the light coming on, how rough this, the, the orthogonal planes look like. Now, this is how your model will look like. So basically, what I want to say is that there are inherent problems with MRI. That, that being said, we use a lot of MRI for all our cardiac printing because we do thin, thin section imaging for MRI. But the problem is thin section MRI comes at the cost of time. If you do one millimeter section on an MRI, it takes three times as long as the standard MRI. So what's the ideal slice thickness? The ideal slice thickness for 3D printing is 1.25 millimeter. And most of our CT scans are either obtained at one millimeter or two millimeter or sub-millimeter. Ideally, sub-millimeter is the best resolution. So we did give the print to our colleague, but we told them we don't know if it's a true representation of the inherent because the study had so many inherent problems. So that's one of the problems. The second problem, if you want to print a vessel or a hollow organ, for example, heart, it's very important to have intravenous contrast, again, to dif distinguish the hollow organ from the surrounding organs. Now, not only presence of contrast is important, the timing of contrast is important. So if you look at this case, this was a case sent to us by adult um, uh, cardiothoracic team. This was a patient with left ventricular aneurysm which ruptured, and you can see this contrast coming out. And they wanted us to print this hard because they wanted to place a mesh. Now what's wrong with this? We actually, eventually, the model turned out to be pretty good. The problem here is that there is more contrast on the right side of the heart as opposed to the left side of the heart. Ideally, if we would have timed this study properly, we would have seen the extravasation much better when the contrast would have been on the left side. So not only the presence of contrast is important, the timing of contrast is also important to have a very good quality or high quality print. Now sometimes you have the best imaging, you have the best software, the problem is anatomy. Now this was an unfortunate kid that was born here, multiple abnormalities, you know, big dystrophic defect in thoracic spine, large thoracic myelomeningocele, bigger than the patient's head, um, hypoplastic left lung, no diaphragm, spleen in the chest, you name it intestinal obstruction, single kidney, and they wanted to print the whole body. And we actually printed this, and this actually came yesterday, it was in the VUMC reporter. This case was in the VUMC reporter yesterday. The problem in this case was just the anatomy. Sometimes the anatomy is so challenging. We don't know where's, where's the heart, where's the lung, which is vessel, which is collapsed lung. So sometimes it's the anatomy is so challenging, it's so time intensive that it's prone to errors. Now, this is the best example I can show to emphasize the point that not only pre-planning is important for a good print, it's sometimes an absolute must. If you don't plan your imaging before, you will not get, not but, you know, you'll never get a model. So this was a patient with cloaca, and I know you guys know what cloaca is, but I want to show you this diagram to show you that, you know, there's a common channel that opens, connects the, the bladder, the vagina, and the colon. And the surgeons wanted to know the length of this channel, the common channel, where the urethra is opening, and these are very, very small channels. And this patient actually had five to seven CT scans and two MRI, done for all for clinical reasons. And we could not even see most of the channels on those conventional imaging. So I told them, we cannot print this. If, if, if you want me to show the length of this common channel, if you want me to show where the colon is opening, where's what is connected, we need to rescan this patient. So what we did is we brought this patient to CT scanner. We placed the Foley catheter in the bladder, Foley catheter in the vagina, Foley catheter in colon. We then tested multiple concentration of contrast. We took one slice every time. We, we, we diluted it, made it concentrated, so make sure that the, the contrast is dense enough to see the channels, but not too dense to cause streak artifacts. And then three of us were in the CT scan room injecting forcefully to opacify these channels, these small channels. You can imagine how difficult to opacify this channel. So this is just to emphasize again and again, sometimes 
we have to plan way ahead to get the, the model in your hand. And look at the model. It turned out awesome. They were, they were really happy. This is the Cloaca model. Um, and the good thing is we can separate every part. We can take, it's all connected with the pledges. So we can take the pubic symphysis out. We can take the colon out. They can look at the channels separately. They can connect that back. They can, and it was extremely helpful to plan the surgery. <clears throat> so now, apart from segmentation, um, there's some slides which just, I just deleted this morning is that there are problems that can go wrong at the printer level too. We have had m m no, kilograms of kilograms of more than, more, uh, melted plastic that went wrong because we didn't plan it. it the orientation will be, the, the, uh, the way we uh, orient the model can change the model and stuff like that. So let's look at the departments we are servicing right now. We're doing a lot of work for our cardiology colleagues. These are some of the models we have printed for our uh, both pediatric and adult cardiology colleagues. We're doing a lot of work with our orthopedic uh, colleagues, again, both on the peach side and the adult side. Uh, these are some of the orthopedic. Uh, this is what they printed to uh, train the residents for C1, uh, C2 um, laminectomy. They wanted to know the, um, the vertebral artery and the relationship of the vertebral artery to the bones. Uh, this is the case I was showing you, the one uh, with, uh, which was very challenging for us. This is the patient who had big myelomeningo seal. They wanted us to print the lungs, the volume of the lungs, had no ribs to do re rib construction surgery. We're doing um, models for our um, neurovascular colleagues. What we are doing is actually very interesting. Not only we are printing them vessels, we are actually attaching a small liver lock mechanism so that you can actually attach a syringe and put a catheter in place and practice. You can inject and you can do flow dynamics also. So that's all we are doing for our neurosurgery, uh, neurosurgery colleagues. Uh, we just started providing service to our craniofacial people. Uh, the, the SLA printer I showed you one with the liquid resin bath, we are producing dental models for them. Uh, we just um, procured this software called as virtual planning software. We haven't started any case. We want to start uh, from 1st of June where we can actually take the CT data and plan the entire surgery. We can cut the mandible, uh, so a craniofacial surgeon will sit down with us and say, you know, cut the mandible, do show me a leaf work one uh, surgery, advance the mandible, rotate the mandible three degrees, uh, show me the final position, show me how much bone I need, show me what plate I need, and we image the fibula, what, what's the length of the fibula you need. So this is all virtual planning without touching the patients. So we now have the software, we own this software. We're going to start planning the surgeries from the month of June. We haven't done much for ENT. That's why I'm here. Uh, we have done one project, as Kyle said. Uh, we printed temporal bones, and, and I think they are presenting. Am I correct? They are you're presenting this next month? Uh, this month. This month. Oh. This month, they're presenting this abstract. We, present, uh, we printed multiple temporal bone models for them to help them drill. And that's why I'm here, so that you guys come up with any, any projects, anything outside out of the box, we'll make it happen. So let's talk about some interesting projects we are doing or the projects we have done. Let's start with teaching and training. I think this is a, this is a great place where 3D printing can be very, very useful. Obviously, it's a no-brainer that 3D printing is much better than practicing on cadaver or experimenting on patient. We have a possibility to simulate in vivo and real tissues. We have a possibility to train residents and fellows and faculty alike different different variations in physiology. Let me show you an example. <clears throat> now, external ventricular drain, or EVD, is the most common procedure that is performed in neurosurgery. And it's often performed by first-year residents. Now, there are multiple EVD stimulator, simulators that are available. One can, have, one can grow their own simulators in-house. The problem is here that these simulators are extremely expensive. If you go and buy an EVD simulator, like a high-end from company, it costs $100,000. Not only they're expensive, they're very time intensive to set up, they're very time intensive to train, and they're not cost effective. So we came up with this EVD simulator. It costs us $10 to create the simulator model. Not talking about the hours, the brainstorming that goes in. The cost of this simulator is only $10. It was extremely cheap, very, very time efficient to set it up. So what we did is, we took a patient who had a CT scan and MRI, both, very, obtained very closely. From the CT scan, we printed the hollow head of the patient. That was the only challenging part of this project. 
Now, if if you if you realize that the way 3D printing works, you know, the plastics is layered is put on the build plate layer by layer. So if you print something hollow, there's nothing to support. Because there's nothing to support the top layer of the skull. Everything will fall down. So we had to do a lot of brainstorming to create this hollow model. So we just we just replicated the arch, the architectural arch technology where they have these arch pillars where the lower layer supports the upper layer without having a support. So it took us a lot of you know time, but once we got it right, we printed we can sorry, we can print this. It takes about five hours to print, and our total cost to print this is eight hours. So from the CT scan, we printed this hollow head. We took this hollow head to the OR, and that's the EVD apparatus, just to show you, that's the EVD catheter, the guidance catheter. We registered this head based on landmarks to the stealth system that is available in the OR. And then we used that MR images for this patient to fuse on the stealth system. I don't know if you guys can see, there's an EVD catheter in, and you can actually see in real time the catheter going in the, the ventricle. So what we did is we invited volunteers to participate in this simulation project. Eleven residents, neurosurgery residents, participated in this simulation program. And everyone was given this hollow head to place the EVD catheter. With no instruction, the success rate for placement of EVD was 44%. Then a senior neurosurgical resident told them how to do it. So verbal instructions were given. You go six centimeters above the EAC and blah, blah, blah. The success rate actually went down. People were confused. Now that's, they're like, everybody like half, it went down by 10%. So then we gave them the MRI data and gave them, told them, told them to practice it. So this is 11 participants having multiple attempts. Some had three attempts, some had four attempts. So 54 attempts were made. At the end of the simulation, the success rate to place the EVD catheter was 98%. And then we took verbal feedback, and everybody said that at the end of the simulation, they had much better understanding of the procedure, they had much better understanding of ventricular anatomy, and they felt very, very comfortable doing this procedure alone. To the extent that now they have incorporated this model as a teaching module for all first-year neurosurgery residents. So this is a great example where 3D printing can be used for teaching or training. Now let's look at some um, clinical case where we, we made a big impact. So we had a patient with double outlet right ventricle. Uh, just to you know, go over what double outlet right ventricle physiology is, you have right atrium, right ventricle, you have the pulmonary artery coming out of the right ventricle, you have aorta coming out from the left ventricle. In DORV physiology, basically you have a big right, right heart you have both the major vessels, both the pulmonary artery and the aorta coming out of the right ventricle. And the left side of the heart is pretty small, and you have a big VSD. So basically, you only have a one-sided functioning heart, which is the right side. So what we did, our cardi cardiology colleagues wanted us to pr uh, print a model for this. So this is the model. I want to orient you because we had to cut this model. We, the, we printed the whole heart, and then we cut the heart. So just to orient you, this is, the, this is the left ventricle, which is cut. This is the left, right atrium and the left atrium, which is cut. This is the right ventricle, which was here, which is cut the right ventricle. Now, if you flip this model 90 degree counterclockwise, you see this hole, and that's what's the VSD, and that's where the VSD is. If you flip this model 90 degree counterclockwise again, you see another hole, and that's the tricuspid valve. So it was printed as a whole heart, and we cut it for them to see where the VSD is, where the tricuspid valve is. And what they were planning before we printed this model was something called as baffle procedure. So what is baffle procedure? So the baffle procedure is basically where they place a baffle, including the VSD, in one of the vessels. And in this case, the aorta, aorta was a smaller vessel, so they wanted to place a baffle, including the VSD and the aorta, so that there's only one vessel coming out of the right ventricle. And as you can see, there both vessels are actually coming out of the right ventricle. So we simulated the baffle procedure using a pen. So we put a pen through the VSD, including the aorta, as you can see here. Everything looked very fine, except that when we turned the model 90 degrees and 90 degrees again, we saw that the baffle would have occluded the tricuspid valve completely. So based on this model, they changed the entire surgical approach. Had they proceed? Now they had everything. They had a MRI, no offense to our cardiology colleague. They had MRI, they had 3D echo, they had multiple echoes, everything was set, patient was supposed to go to surgery, and they said, you know, let's do a 3D print. 
we gave the 3D print, they said, no, we cannot do a baffle procedure. The whole surgical approach in this patient was changed, saving the patient maybe multiple days in hospitalization, morbidity, and so on and so forth. So this is a great example. Now, we have done multiple other um, models for our cardiology colleague where we have changed uh, their surgical approach. Now, as you see the word virtual here, so what we are doing is now, they're not even asking for print. We give them the PDF, which they can rotate, and they are deciding the surgical approach based on PDF. So we have the ability to give you the physical model or the virtual model. So we can do both. And half of you know, our cardiology service is based on virtual model itself. Last year, um, we were very fortunate to win the RADx Challenge Award. I don't know if you know about the RADx Challenge Award. It was like a Shark Tank-like thing where Vanderbilt came up with an innovation award. If you have a, a good idea, pitch it to us and we'll fund you. So we, what the idea we pitched was to use 3D printing to produce customized CPAP masks for kids with craniofacial deformity. And they liked the idea and it was funded so right now we have three pediatric patients that are enrolled in this uh, project, but we were fortunate for an adult patient to volunteer first, and he's an engineer by profession. He said, I really want to be the subject for your first CPAP mask. Uh, I'm an engineer, I can provide feedback to you, input to you, and he was really, really frustrated with the CPAP mask. So what we did is, that's where we, we utilized our 3D scanner, the optical scanner, if you remember. We placed him on a chair, we scan his face, and this is the end result after the 3D scanner. If I blow this up, you can actually see the hair follicles. That's the resolution of that 3D scanner. We can see the, each and every hair follicle. So we created a digitalized uh, 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 profile of his face, and then we created the mask in two steps. So if you, you guys, if you guys have seen CPAP mask, it has a plastic piece that interfaces with the tubing, and it, there's a it, there's a um, a soft or malleable part that interfaces with the patient face. So we took the same approach. We first created the, the hard part, or the plastic part, which is going to interface with the uh, tubing. Uh, this is pretty standard. We, we kept it. We, we, we came up with two different prototypes. We ended up deciding using this one. The second thing is we used that, the scanned data of his face. We created a 3D made model of his face. And then we created a negative mold of his face. And we, we pour silicone gel into it to create the soft part. And this soft part now has two parts, a hard part and a soft part, which perfectly matches his facial contour. And this was very early prototype, and then this is the final mask which we sent the patient. Now, I think this, this mask was sent to him maybe a month ago. Maybe a month ago. Uh, and this is what, sorry, <laughs> this is what uh, he texted us back. And because I'm running out of time, the mass is comfortable, easy to get on, all of the prototypes is equal or superior to any of the four things. Now that, last but not the least, talking something out of, uh, different from, radio, uh, from radiology and medical 3D printing, we were very fortunate to collaborate with Wandry and History Department to replicate their preserved 3D artifacts for their history show, which is right now going on in Wandry. So what we did, we took all these artifacts, used our scanners, replicated them, and they were hand painted, and these are all the 3D printed models. These are all 3D preserved artifacts. And this is the final, I think I have a video of it, please. We thought it would be a good way to show what the humanities can do connected to the world of digital preservation. It merges pre-Christian, African, and indigenous kind of trickster figures with the Christian devil. So this is an exciting example where, you know, where, where participants can go to the show, examine the, the artifact, handle it. It just takes you away from look, don't touch ethos of a museum. Uh, bioprinting, I think the future of medical 3D printing is bioprinting. The future is to fabricate organs. We are still about 10, 15 years away, but that's where 3D printing, medical 3D printing is heading. 
there have been some success in medical 3D printing uh, bladder, urethra. Now they are not life-size organs printed, but they are viable and biologically functional things that are being printed. Um, five minutes. I'll briefly tell you. Now, the, what's, what about the, everybody asks me, what's the financial impact? Now, right now, there are no CPD codes, but FDA is working right now to have CPD codes for 3D printing. I think within a few years, we'll have billable codes, and there'll be a no-brainer. Every hospital will have 3D printing because they'll make money out of it. In the interest of time, I just want to, so right now, the literature is all case report, case series, and they talk about the way, how can we save money? One, we can save money based on reduced complication, reduced length of stay, reduce OR cost, OR cost. So what we, and reduce readmission. So what we did is basically, we took the numbers which the literature was saying. We took it, we, look at, we looked at our numbers, how many OR cases we have. We came up with this number to show how much money can we save based on reduced complications, OR cost, and so on and so forth. The number right now is pretty small, but this number applies to patients who have complex medical diseases, so these are high-end medical users. So the impact, even though it's small, can be magnified because it applies to patients who need medical uh, support all the time. This is my last slide. This is just again, please come up with projects. If you have any 3D printing needs, please feel free to contact us. We're happy to collaborate. If you have any idea, whether simulation, patient training, education training, surgical navigation, um, please feel free to contact us. Um, again, this is, you can request prints via Epic or you can click on this link. And this is our team. Thank you very much for your attention.